Welcome to the hydrology course. I'm really excited about teaching this course after doing several one-day seminars on hydrology for soil and water conservation districts. I'm looking forward to kind of expanding on those hydrology topics and hopefully getting other people interested in it. Uh, just a note, if you're here and you work primarily in urban hydrology, we will be covering the basics of urban hydrology and also agricultural rural hydrology. So you'll see references to agricultural BMPs and urban BMPs and the hydrology to, to come up with design flows for each. Now, what are the, some, some of the BMPs that, that need hydroly, hydrology studies? Uh, we've got diversions, wascops, terraces. These are all agricultural practices. Closed drainage networks are typically in urban areas. Uh, flood control can be both. Green infrastructure practices are, are typically urban again. Uh, stream restoration is typically rural. Uh, culverts, uh, manure storages. And the thing I want to highlight is that some of these practices only require peak flow rates, and others require you to know the entire storm volume. So a peak flow rate is is achievable, say, using EFH2 or the rational method. But in order to get the whole storm volume, uh, you'll need something more complicated. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. If you need the, the whole storm volume, you'll have to develop a hydrograph and use a method that uh, provides that. And we'll cover what a hydrograph is in a moment. So first off, uh, I want to give you a sense of what is the best method of hydrology. Um, you know how uh, we're, we're coming up with stream flows or, or or storm volumes. What's the best method? The best method is stream gauge data. Okay, this is an actual historical record of storm flows uh, at a site. Okay, obviously the problem is stream gauge data only exists for streams of a certain size, and most of our hydrology studies are for small watersheds. So it's rare to find a stream gauge near your your site unless you're doing a bridge opening or something. Okay, the next best option is regional curves developed from stream gauge data. And these are really useful except that they have the same kind of size limitations as stream gauges. Okay, the, the regional curves are developed from stream gauges, so they're only uh, uh, effective on watersheds down to the smallest stream gauged site in your uh, your region of the state okay so you can't use them on your one acre watershed leading to your, your catch basin okay next best is something is it is how we get into hydrologic modeling okay so the SCS uh, it formerly called SCS now it's called NRCS uh, they have two methods for rural sites you can use EFH2 for urban sites you can use TR20 uh, which is sometimes called TR55, which is the pen and paper version of the TR20 method. And then finally, I'd say the least reliable is the rational method, although it's still quite commonly used for catch basin closed drainage network design. And for that, it, it is fine. So let's talk a little bit about where you would learn more about each of these topics, because we're not going to cover them all in this course. Okay, for stream gauge data and regression curves, you need to go to your state stream stats program for New York. It looks like this, and each stream stats program uh, has background documentation. For New York, it's these two documents, uh, Lumia and Freehofer is magnitude of frequency of floods in New York. Uh, that covers um, that covers drainage area and peak flow, I believe, and then this one covers the bankful discharge and channel characteristics. So for New York, we have two components of stream stats, one for the bankful channel cross-section and one for the magnitude of the uh, of frequency floods. All right, how about TR55 and EFH2? Those are both derived from the National Engineering Handbook Part 630. Okay, it used to be called NEH Section 4. It's an NRCS publication. It's hundreds and hundreds of pages. You do not want to read it. But there's two derived documents uh, that, that are worth reading. Uh, EFH2 for agricultural lands. It's only seven pages. Download it from the NRCS website. Or I've attached it here as an attachment to this lecture. Uh, TR55 is also a good, uh, a good resource. Um, like I said, it's kind of the pen and paper version of the TR20 method. Uh, and 
the TR20 manual isn't really helpful because it's a software program, uh, but the TR55 manual is really helpful. It goes through the steps and how how each equation is derived and, and how to use it. And I've also attached this to this lecture. The only place I found it online is the HydroCAD website. I'm not really sure why that is. Okay, and the rational method, uh, since we're in New York State, I'm going to recommend the New York State DOT Highway Drainage Manual, or Highway Design Manual, Chapter 8, Highway Drainage. Okay, it has a nice little section on the rational method and kind of where it came from and how to use it. Uh, but we will be covering the rational method in this, uh, in this series. So I mentioned hydrographs before. Uh, it, it, and you might be asking, what is a hydrograph? Well, it just shows the flow rate in a stream over time. Okay, in our cases, we're going to be developing hydrographs for a set amount of time, typically a design storm length. But this is just a regular one for a river. It's a uh, East Branch Delaware River after Hurricane Irene. Um, you can see, you know, before the flows reached the uh, the gauge, it was, you know, this level, just over 1,000 CFS, and then once all the water in the watershed got down to this gauge, it reached a peak, and then, you know, after the storm was over, it kind of gradually settled down. They had some flood control measures, which is why this is level, and then they let more water out and, you know, gradually went down. So this is kind of what we're looking at when we think of a, a hydrograph. This top it's just the peak discharge, and a lot of our practices, we only need the peak discharge. This time window from when the flow at the design point, or the gauge, when it starts increasing to the peak discharge, that's called the time of concentration. That's the time that it takes the furthest raindrops in the watershed to flow all the way down to the design point. Now, different watersheds are going to have hydrographs with different shapes. And I'm going to cover that uh, in this slide. On this side, it shows the effective basin size on the hydrograph. So a very small uh, watershed. Well, I wouldn't say this is small, one kilometer squared, but uh, you know, it's a small uh, peak flow with a short time of concentration. As the basin size gets bigger, obviously the peak is going to get bigger, but also the time of concentration will increase as well, right? So in this first one, it only takes a short time for the furthest drops to get to the design point. In this one, it takes much longer for the furthest drops to get to the design point. Okay, and basin slope and shape is going to make a difference too. Okay, if you have a basin that's steeply sloped and elongated, you'll have a short time of concentration with a high peak. The more diffuse it is and flatter, uh, you'll get a, a lower peak discharge in a longer time of concentration. I, I think in this, um, for these three examples, they're all the same area, say in square kilometers, but um, they're each going to have a different time of concentration and peak flow. Now one thing to consider is storage in the watershed. If there's ponds or wetlands in your watershed, you need to take those into account because water in your watershed will collect in those areas instead of just flowing straight down to your design point. Um, and you can use NEH 630 uh, to estimate the peak discharge in watersheds, in, uh, in rural watersheds, I would say. In urban watersheds with storage, you should break it up into sub-watersheds and use a modeling program such as HydroCAD to, to figure that out. But I think for rural sites, uh, you can use NEH 630. They have adjustment factors for ponds and wetlands uh, to help you figure out what the modified discharge would be for those. Now I want to talk about rainfall distributions. We're trying to come up with how much runoff runs off a site, so we need to know kind of how much rainfall hits the site. And we want to know how intense is the heaviest rainfall, because that'll that'll produce the greatest uh, the flow rates for our BMPs. Uh, historically, we had synthetic rainfall distributions called type 2, type 3, etc. It was a storm duration of 24 hours, and the intensity of the rainfall varies over the storm period. Uh, in 2013, the Northeast Regional Climate Center updated uh, rainfall distributions for the Northeast United States and New York Falls in that, so 
we should be using the new rainfall distributions type A, B, C, and D. And these are also 24-hour storms. You might be asking, what is a synthetic rainfall distribution? What, why do we use it? Well, I'm not going to explain that right now, but I want you to go to TR55 at Appendix B and read the sheet on synthetic rainfall distributions. It's actually a pretty handy tool for doing hydrology uh, so that you know everybody can be using a uniform uh, format of data. Uh, you know, we can, we can get individual rainfall amounts, but we're uh, coming up with intensities that are kind of uniform across uh, the field. So if you're looking for uh, the synthetic distribution type in New York, you can go to this map on the NRCS engineering website for New York. And it just has all the counties and it says whether you're A, B, C, or D. Okay, if you're on one of these tiles that is a border between two of the types, uh, there's blow-up maps of those, and it'll show you know which towns are in which uh, types. And then finally, I want to just uh, show you the distributions. This is what it looks like. This is a synthetic rainfall distribution curve. On the left, you have the cumulative rainfall fraction. So at the top, at the end of the storm, you've received 100% of the rainfall. That would be 1 times however many inches of rainfall that storm produces. Uh, 12 hours is right in the middle. And then for, um, for, for each specific storm length, say if you have a, uh, a one hour storm, you're going to be sampling uh, the rainfall 30 minutes on either side of this midpoint. Okay, so that's how, if you read the tier 55 appendix B, it says, uh, the storms are nested, so kind of the five-minute storm is nested inside the 10-minute, is nested inside the 30-minute. Okay, so for each design storm, we're looking at, you know, kind of half the length on either side, making up a total time duration. That's all I want to cover in this introduction. Uh, I'm attaching those uh, reference documents. I definitely browse through those so you get a sense of of where to learn more and where to look up uh, answers to your questions.